the thousands who did not have bread I saw him bring people back from the dead He drove out demons from the demon bound And taught us how to walk on holy ground He made the leper skin like new The storm dissipated when he told it to Took jars of water, turned it into wine To save even heal this heart of mine We have seen His glory We have seen His glory King David, the man after God's own heart, the king of Israel, the man that God chose to rule his people, committed a very treacherous sin. The Bible says that David committed adultery with a woman, took a man's wife, and then had him killed. God sentenced him to several years of hard aches and pains. And that's when David picked up his pen and he wrote these words in Psalms 51. Listen to the words of David, Psalms 51 and verse number one. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are ever before me. And then in verse number 12, he says these words, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. David enters into his prayer chamber. He begins to pray to God in the palace. It's a painful prayer that David others hear. If you read Psalms 51, David says that I feel like my bones are broken. Then David says my heart is broken and my spirit is broken. He's a, a broken man. If you look at David, you look in his eyes, there are tears in his eyes. And if you see David He's pacing the floor in the midnight hour because David can't sleep. His conscience is bothering him. Oh, there is a royal king-sized bed in the, in the room, but David can't sleep. The, the bed is decked with purple and fine linen, but, but David cannot sleep. Yes, the royal robe and the scepter is in that room, but, but David doesn't feel like a king anymore. And the Bible says, and David says these words, I'm a worm and not a man. The high cost of low living. Oh, yes. And David says, I feel dirty. He cries out to God, cleanse me, O God, wash me, O God. Make me clean. The high cost of low living. And oh, if David had a song to sing, David would sing that song. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mama, not my papa, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my son, nor my daughter, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And David would have another verse, and David would say these words. It's not Bathsheba, nor Uriah, but it's me, O oh Lord.
standing in the need of prayer. Oh, if David had a song, he would sing today. Oh, if David had a song, he, he would sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, David would have a song to sing if David could sing today. And now David is begging God. He's begging God for a need. Oh, David has a need today, and he falls down on his knees, and he looks up to God, and he began to ask God for a, a blessing. David doesn't want food. It's not food that David wants. It's not money and wealth that David wants. It's not, it's not position and power that David wants. Oh, it's not prestige, and it is not prestige that David wants. David wants something that is much greater. David wants joy. And he says, he says, restore the joy of thy salvation. That's the subject. Restore, restore, restore the joy of my salvation. Oh, Lord, I want some joy. I need your joy, Lord. I need it right now, Lord. I need it. Can I tell you this? Oh, joy is one of the greatest blessings that God has ever given man. Joy. Joy is better than happiness. Happiness depends on what's happening. If things are good, you are happy. But, but joy does not rest on external circumstances. You can have joy in the midst of, of pain and sorrow and affliction and illness. You can have joy. Oh, joy. Joy is a great blessing. And now David is down on his knees. He's praying to God, Lord, give me the joy of your salvation, Lord. I want joy. That's what joy. I want joy, Lord. I need to tell you this. There was a time there was a joy in David's life. If you read the history of David's life, there was joy. And David was a man of joy. He talks about it in Psalms 21 in verse number one. He says, he says, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord. I got joy. And do you remember the, the psalm, the psalm that he said, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Old David had some joy when he came to the house of the Lord. David couldn't wait to get to the house of the Lord because there was joy in the house of the Lord. Nothing could stop David from going into the house of the Lord. There was joy and peace in the house of the Lord. Can I ask you the question today? Do you have joy? Are you glad when you come to the house of the Lord? I want to ask you again. Are you glad to worship the Lord? Are you glad to come to the house of the Lord? Something is wrong. I, I said something is wrong when you are not glad to come into the house of the Lord. There is something wrong in your life when there is no gladness. When you come to worship, there is something wrong when you do not enjoy worship, Lord. There is something wrong, Lord. There is someone here that does not enjoy worship. Something is wrong wrong in your life. If you are a Christian, you are a child of God, and, and you do not enjoy worship, something is wrong today. Man is defined by what he enjoys. Can I say it again? I said man is defined by what he enjoys. You tell me what you enjoy, and I can tell you who you are. Tell me what you enjoy, and I can write your biography. Tell me what you enjoy, and I can predict your destiny. Do you enjoy? When you come into the house of the Lord, there ought to be joy. You ought to enjoy worshiping the Lord. Leave your anger at the door and come on in. Leave your vengeance at the door and come on in and worship God. 
Get the chip off your shoulder and come on in and worship God. Enjoy the house of the Lord. I tell you, I tell you, David enjoyed and David had joy in his life, but David lost his joy. I got to ask the question. I got to ask David today, King David, where is your joy? Where is your joy? What happened to your joy, David? What happened? Where did your joy go? Yeah, David would testify. It was sin. It was sin that stole my joy. Say it again, David. It was sin that stole my joy. David says, I acknowledge my sin. And ten times in this chapter, David is talking about sin. And David is talking about transgression. And, and David is talking about iniquity. Over and over again, what David is saying, uh, sin stole my joy. Can I tell you today, sin is a terrible thing. Sin will steal your joy. Can I say it one more time? Sin will steal your joy. David could testify today. He would say, sin will bring tears to your eyes. If David could testify today, David would say, the sin will break your heart. Sin will steal your joy. Or if David could testify today, he would tell all of us, don't mess with sin. Sin is a terrible thing. It will steal your joy. It will steal your joy. What, he, what had happened to David it was painful and was so painful. Sin was ever before him. That's what he says. My sin, my sin is ever before me. In other words, I, I see my sin all the time. I, I'm bothered by my conscience, a bad conscience. I keep on seeing my sin. Every time I close my eyes, I can see my sin. I can see my sin. And David had a real problem. Because the woman he was sleeping with, his wife Bathsheba, Reminded him of his sin. She reminded him of his sin because David had taken her from her husband, had taken her from Uriah, and then had Uriah killed. And I can imagine every time, every time, every time that David looked in her eyes, he saw Uriah. Sin is a terrible thing. David had a bad conscience. David had a bad conscience. David had nightmares. David had flashbacks. And I believe every time he went up on the roof, that's where it all happened. When he went on the rooftop of his house, he was reminded of those bad days. It was sweet and bitter memories as he stood on the balcony of his rooftop. It's funny sometimes how places can remind you of certain things. Places can remind you of sweet and bitter memories. Can anybody say amen? Sometimes songs can remind you of bitter and sweet memories. Sometimes a smell can bring back bitter and sweet memories. David had a problem. Oh, David had a problem. It was so bad. It was so bad. David cries out. Lord, blot out my transgressions. Lord, delete it from my memory. Lord, delete it from my hard drive, the hard drive of my memory, Lord. Blot it out. It's so painful. David said, blot it out. I tell you, sin will steal your joy. Then David says, I feel dirty, Lord. And sin will make you feel dirty. Oh, sin will make you feel dirty. And, and, and David said these words, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. I feel dirty, Lord. Wash me thoroughly. Wash me clean from my iniquity. It reminds me of baptism. 
Bible says this in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. The Bible says, oh, the Bible says these words, arise and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I want to tell you today that Ivory soap can't wash away your sins. I want to tell you today that dove can't wash away your sin. I want to tell you today that body wash can wash away your sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sins. I want to go back to the scene that it all happened. I want to go back to that evening, that evening. I want to go back to the scene of the crime. The Bible said that David was in his palace one day. And the Bible said that David sent off his armor to fight. But the Bible said that David stayed home. I want to put a peg right here. And I want to talk to all the young people right now. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. David should have been out fighting with, the, with his soldiers, but David decided to stay at home. Wrong place, wrong time will lead to disastrous ends. It will lead to misery and pain. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, he was at home, but he should have been on the battlefield. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong circumstances. Wrong things. The Bible says that now David goes up on the rooftop, his patio on the rooftop of the palace. Then the Bible says that David looked out and saw a naked woman bathing in a pool. A naked woman bathing in a pool. Uh, I want to tell all men right now, men, if you ever see a naked woman bathing in a pool, you better turn your head. You better shut your eyes. You better go back. You better turn around and go back. David didn't do that. David didn't do that, but the Bible says that David called a serpent servant. And David asked the servant, who is this woman? David began to inquire. That's wrong. Wait a minute, David. Wait a minute, David. Wait a minute, David. You, you are getting into trouble, David. The Bible says he asked the, the servant, who is this woman? Can I tell you this? There's a message today. You ought to nip sin in the bud. I said you ought to nip sin in the bud. Old David had a chance now to nip sin in the bud. But David now began to inquire about the woman. He, he began to ask his servant about the woman. And the servant says, this is the wife of Uriah. And David was the king, and David could have had any woman that he wanted. But there was one problem. This woman was a married woman. It was a sin for David to have a sexual relationship with this woman. It was a sin. The Bible says that David sent the servant to get Bathsheba. And the Bible said that Bathsheba came to his house. David, you're getting into trouble now. David, you're getting into trouble now. Stop, David. Stop Why you got a chance, David. You got a chance. Now. Stop where you are, David. The sirens are going, and the, and the sirens are blasting, and the, and the lights are flashing. Stop, David. Danger, danger, danger. But the Bible says that that day David slept with her. And then sent her home. Sent her home. Yes, sent her home. And the Bible said these words. Just in a few weeks as a message come to David, Bathsheba sends a message to King David and say, I am pregnant. I'm having your baby. Oh, David. David. David, what have you done? 
Now David began to try to cover up. Now David began to try to cover up his sins. The Bible says he sent to the war. He sent for Uriah, her husband, to come back from the war. And then David told her husband, go in, go in and have and, and lie with your wife. But, but Uriah being the man that he was, the Bible said he would not sleep with his wife knowing that his brothers were out on the battlefield. And the Bible said that the Uriah slept on the king's doorstep. David got a problem. David tried several times to get Uriah to go and sleep with his wife. But the Bible says um, that, that he even got Uriah drunk. And Uriah, Uriah wouldn't go in and sleep with his wife. Oh, David got a problem now. He got a problem now. David tried to cover it up. Can I tell you something, my brothers and sisters? Put a peg here. Don't cover up your sins. I, I said, don't cover up your sins. I said, it's frustrating and it's stressful trying to cover up your sins. The Bible said these words. The Bible said these words. He that covered up his sin shall not prosper. Say it again, Gray. He that covered his sin shall not prosper. David tried to cover up his sins. Oh, yes. Then David got the idea. The only way I can bury my sins is to bury Uriah, her husband. That's when David got another plan. That's when David sent a sealed letter by Uriah to Joab, the commanding chief of the army. And if you read, if you read, if you read the message, it says to Joab, put Uriah in the heat of the battle and then withdraw troops and that he may surely be killed. And it happened just as David planned. Uriah was killed. And the Bible says that that's when David sent for Bathsheba and she became his wife. Oh, yes, don't try to cover up your sins. Don't try to cover up your sins. It was the perfect plan. It was the perfect crime. Nobody saw it. Nobody knew about it. It was the perfect crime. But God knew it. God saw everything. God saw everything. God saw everything. You can't hide anything from God. It was the perfect crime. It was a case of how to get away with murder. But God saw it. I, I wish I can tell you that David lived happily ever after, but I can't tell you that. I can tell you that because that was trouble in David's life. From now on, David would be a man that would experience all kinds of heartaches and pains in his, in his marriage and in his home. The Bible says these words, God sent the prophet Nathan to David. And the prophet Naaman had this conviction and this sinners. He said, David, the sword shall not depart from your house. There are going to be problems in your house, David. There's going to be killing in your house, David. All because of the sin that you committed, David. And it happened as the Bible says. The child that was born by David and uh, Bathsheba died. And then the Bible said that David's son raped his own sister. And then one boy killed another boy for raping his sister. Then the Bible says that Absalom, his son, formed the coup, ran his father away from the kingdom. Then Absalom Slept with David's wife, his own son. I tell you, sin is a terrible thing. Then the Bible says that Absalom was killed. All because of sin. 
Can I tell you this? All sin have consequences. Every sin has a consequence. Small sins, large sins, black sins, white sins, sweet sins, bitter sins, all sins have consequences. And sometimes the Bible says these words, be sure your sin will find you out. God says, be sure your sins will find you out. When you least expect it, your sin will find you out. You can run, but you can't hide. And even when you forget it, your sin will find you out. It's amazing how one moment of passionate lust can lead to a lifetime of sorrow. One hot night will cause many cold days. One, one domino falling can cause a multitude of failures. Just one time, just one sin can cause a multitude of sins. Somebody ought to know what I'm talking about today. One sin. The Bible says this, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's the law of sowing and reaping. There are, there are three laws of, of sowing and reaping. First of all, you are going to sow exactly what you reap. You're going to sow exactly what you reap. If you sow turnip greens, you're going to get turnip greens. If you sow good, you're going to get good. If you sow bad, you're going to get bad. You're going to sow exactly what you, you're going to reap exactly what you sow. That's the law of sowing and reaping. And there's another law. There's another law of sowing and reaping. And it says this, you will reap more than you sow. Take those turnip grain seeds. Oh, you can sow just a few seeds. But oh, at harvest time, you got to have a bushel because you are going to reap more than you sow. And then there was another law of sowing and reaping that says you reap later than you sow. Oh, you may not reap the same day. And somebody say, hey, amen, you may not reap the same day you sow. It may take days, it may take weeks, it may take months, it even may take years, but you are going to reap what you sow. It's going to reap what you sow. There's a time of germination. My little granddaughter, five years old, uh, we went out to plant some tomato seeds in a pot. Oh, she was so curious about planting. And the next day she got up and she went out there looking for tomatoes. Can you believe that? I said, honey, you reap now, you sow now, but you reap later. You may not see tomatoes for another month or two months because you sow now and you reap later. That's the law of sowing and reaping. Then I have another testimony today from this particular passage. The assurance of salvation brings joy. Let me say it again. The assurance of salvation brings joy. And David cried. Restore the joy of my salvation. This, uh, restore the joy of thy salvation. Don't you know there is joy in knowing that you're saved? Can somebody testify today? Don't you know there is joy in knowing that you're right? You, you're right and you know that you're right. You are, you are in the church and you know you're on your way to heaven. It's a joy in knowing that you're saved and knowing that you're saved. And you're on your way to heaven. There is a joy. You can sleep at night. There was a peaceful joy. Knowing that you are saved. Bible says and Paul says, I know in whom I believed. 
And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I, I know I'm saved, Paul said. I know I'm on my way to heaven. And Paul enjoyed a life of joy because he knew he was saved and on his way to heaven. Joy. 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 The joy of salvation. I met a friend a long time ago, whom I hadn't seen in a long time. He looked a little rough. I hadn't seen him in a long time, and his clothes and his car and his personal hygiene spelled crises. He hugged me, and I had to hold my nose. You know what I'm talking about. His clothes were a little bit raggedy. And yes, he was driving an old beat-up car. But he said, Gray, Gray, I want to tell you this, Gray. I don't have the money that I used to have. But I got Jesus, and I got joy. I don't drive the BMW that I used to drive, but, but Gray, I got joy. I don't live in the house on top of the hill anymore. I live in the valley now, but I still got joy. And I tell you, Gray, my wife left me for another man now, but I still got joy. And then he broke out with a song. He said, I've got joy, joy, joy down in my heart. I got the peace and understanding of Jesus down in my heart. I've got joy, joy, joy down in my heart and I got to ask you today do you have joy do you have the joy of salvation do you have joy for those who cannot come out to the house of God today we bring you the Lord's Supper Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and he did it for a reason he says do this in remembrance of me Oh, sometimes we forget about the Lord, but every Lord's day, we should remember him by the partaking of the Lord's Supper. These emblems, the bread and the fruit of the vine. We want to pray for the bread and the wine. We want to take this communion today in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh, God in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ and coming down to this world to die for our sins. Help us, O oh God, to ever remember him. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is the bread. Jesus says, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He says, drink ye all of it. This is my blood in the New Testament. Amen and amen. Against me, but God will stand.